It's the final round of the Tata Steel Masters, and I'm looking at the four games that featured the five leaders going to this final round. So next up, we have Anish Giri against Max Varmadam. And Giri started the tournament incredibly well, but had a dip in the middle, but came back into contention in the final rounds. So here we go. And he's got white against Max Varmadam, who's right at the bottom of the tournament. He's played some really interesting chess, actually, but I think his inexperience at the highest level really told in these final few rounds. So, let's see. Could Giri take advantage of the fact that he was playing the, the uh, bottom player in the tournament? Let's have a look. So, fairly cagey start from Giri. He's basically making sure he's not playing anything too main line and trying to catch out his opponent. Good strategy. C4. Although it has to be said that this particular system has been played quite a lot over the past uh, few years. But, yeah, you could say theory has yet to crystallise on what's going on here. And Giri took the chance to play something a little bit, uh, well, adventurous, let's put it like that, right at the start. But, yeah, these ideas with g4 and h4 and you know, in combination sometimes with queen c2, actually pretty well known in this kind of position. It's dangerous. You know, what does black do here? If you take then, well, okay, the combination of rook and bishop looking at that g7 pawn, I don't think the king would feel too comfortable there. So what else we got? Well, d4 is possible. That was played in a game between uh, Anand and Ho Yifan. Well, if Anand is playing this with white, that's a badge of respectability. And actually, that was a pretty wild game. But Varmadam played simply with knight c6. He's already invested a little bit of time, so he's not too familiar with his position. g5, let's push again. Knight e4 and h4. So Giri has gained some very nice space on the king side and you can get away with this because you basically just have a solid shell in the middle of the board the position is certainly not opening white's king is quite safe at the moment right what's next rook e8 well this was varmadam's first really big think in the game he spent 20 minutes over rook e8 20 minutes now that is a sign of a player who is tired and demoralized. You know, that's if you spend that much time, you're liable to get into time pressure and then all bets are off, at least for you. Queen C2, a sound move, a good move, so typical of this system. The queen has influence over this diagonal, looking down to black's king. But, of course, it prepares as well to castle queenside and brings the queen's rook into play. So, threatens the knight in the middle of the board. So, knight takes c3. And this is an excellent move, which was perhaps underestimated by Varmadam. Pawn takes knight. Really good. Yes, it blocks out this bishop for the moment, but it opens up the d-file, and when the rook reaches d1, that's very uncomfortable for black's queen. g6. Well, probably got to make this move sooner or later, because bishop d3, for example, is coming. And I think it's good just to castle straight away, actually. This is already quite a serious threat, but h5 played... Also, very natural, let's just crack open the h-file. And, you know, white's moves are kind of so easy, so natural. Castle's queenside, bishop d3, you're hammering down on g6, you're hammering down the h-file. This is tough, very tough for black. Knight e5, 
fair enough. So after that exchange, at least this bishop covers on the diagonal. It's very important that the bishop covers these squares. Castle's queenside. Well, after just 12 moves, I think we can say that Giri has had a dream outcome from the opening. If you're in a must-win situation, you know, you've got a fantastic attack against your opponent's king. Your king is safe. Um, your pieces are very well placed. The only bishop b2, okay, you can put up with that. The rest of the white's pieces are fantastically placed. I mean, this is like a free hit. You've got a beautiful attack with no risk at all. Bishop g7, bishop drops back. So this could be a threat. So f4, I and mean, it's a nice move to make anyway. So it secures the pawn chain, but also gives the queen perhaps the opportunity to fly across the h-file. e5. I mean, I think this move is essential. It, it It's a pretty horrible move to make, considering that d5 is on. But if you don't play e5, well, where is black's counterplay? You know, this pawn is vulnerable to attack. Queen h2 is coming, an exchange here, and queen h7 check, and... You know, it's not going to be too difficult to organise an exchange on d5 and bring this bishop into the game. I mean, this, this is just dreadful. So, Vabadam had to play e5 in spite of the weakening of d5. He has to get this bishop into the game on one of these squares and create some counterplay down the e-file. Exchange on g6. Now... Geary has so many attractive possibilities here. He played in a very straightforward way. He spent just six minutes over this next move, bishop d3. Um, you know, he was playing pretty quickly, certainly relative to Varmadan. The, the move that uh, my machine likes here is bishop h3. And as we'll see from the game... This actually cuts out a lot of black's counterplay. A lot of black's counterplay is based on the fact that this bishop can reach f5 or g4, and bishop h3 just cuts the counterplay. Um, if, for example, an exchange, the queen is going to come across to h2, d5 is probably going to drop. There could just be the simple plan of tripling on the h-file and, and delivering checkmate. Um, it really is very, very strong. You could just take here. But then the problem is, well, how does the bishop get into the game? You could also take on d5 with a pawn. Now, that is more appealing because we might be able to play c4 and then this bishop plays a very significant part in the game. And mate on the h-file is possible. I mean, black does have counterplay there in various ways involving this bishop, but still, also a very attractive move. But as I said, the move that the engine prefers is bishop h3, and it just kills black's counterplay, actually. Anyway, bishop d3 feels also like a really natural move. An exchange on f4, and actually... Bishop g4, remarkably, isn't too bad for black. Um, this actually gives some counterplay. So, for example, after this, an exchange here, and queen c7. You can see that white's king is a little bit insecure, actually. But Varmadam was kind of phased. And in this position, he played queen c7 very quickly. I think the problem is, when you invest a lot of time early on in the game you know you're you you're aware of your clock and you think oh yeah i've got to make a quick move okay queen c7 looks good you don't have time to appreciate when the really critical moment in the game is and that was a critical position queen c7 played rook h4 defends the pawn here Geary just wanting to attack. He could have played like this. 
I mean, this also gives this gives White the advantage. White is definitely better in that end game um, with c4 coming. But Giri was clearly just wanting to go all out for the attack, and he played rook h4. And after pawn takes c4, bishop takes g6. He just crashed in. You know, he wants to put maximum pressure on black. And white pieces here, of course, look fantastic. Only problem is, this bishop, as I mentioned before, it doesn't get in the game. And actually, black can defend this position. Queen c6 is a good move, for example, which just covers a few things. And um, yeah, in this position, this is actually playable for black. Black is all right there. Black should hold. King f8 played. f5. Woof. This is so dangerous. Queen f7. Okay, the, the, the queen covers. Queen d6 check. And here Varmadam put the king on g8. He should have played queen e7. I can understand why he was reluctant to do this, because it reaches an end game which is a bit tricky. You know, can black survive this one? You're a pawn down, the king could also be in a spot of trouble with these opposite color bishops. Well, the machine shows that in fact black has sufficient counterplay here, but it is quite tricky. Uh, and there are other variations here. I mean, I can understand why you know, he was short of time, perhaps, you know, didn't like the look of this one as well. This is also very scary. Um, F6, you know, you might look at that and think, oh my goodness, black is already lost, considering it takes some time for these pieces to get in the game. In fact, black is still okay in this position after this move, remarkably. Very hard to judge when you're short of time. King g8 played. F6. White is just pushing forward. You, you know, you mustn't take your foot off the gas, basically. Okay, watch out for a check here. Queen F4. Queen F5. Black is desperately chasing an endgame now. And this is not an easy position. Um, I mean, my computer shows that Rook E5, not an obvious move, is the best move. But this is a very uncomfortable position with c4 coming, and that's worse than the other positions we looked at. That is a very strong attack. In any case, Varmadam played bishop e6, and Giri crashed in like this, and this is now losing. Rook f4, queen e6, queen h2, threatening mate. Yeah, this bishop is locked out of the game, but actually Giri didn't need it. Very easy to overlook, you know, tactics here. Giri played rook f7. Nice finish. Very nice finish. So after king takes, then queen h7 will do the job. Queen f7, and here's the clever move. Very easy to overlook. g6, it's the only winning move. But it does the job beautifully. So, for example, queen takes g6, rook g1. Okay, that's that's an easy one. King takes g6, queen g2, followed either by rook f1 or rook h1. And otherwise, well, again, a very nice finish. But I'm sure that this this is winning. But rook d7, that's absolutely decisive. Beautiful. Razor sharp. Calculated perfectly. So if queen takes, then we've got queen h7 with a nice skewer. And if king g6, rook d6 just wins the queen. And that extra bishop will come into the game shortly. And final thing, rook e7. Yeah, this is nice. Check. Queen h4. And rook takes rook. 
extra piece, and a matey attack. That will do the job nicely. I think a really good game from Geary, you know, I can nitpick in this game and say, well, White could have attacked better with this move or that move. With this kind of wild position, impossible to play perfectly. But basically, he he played in the right spirit. That's important for these crunch last round games. He played kind of with a free hand. You know, he, he wasn't concerned about getting everything right. He just played quickly and, you know, with played for the initiative. And he said after the game, he just felt so much more relaxed than last year when he won the tournament. But, you know, there was kind of pressure. He, he felt real pressure to, you know, play for first place. This year, this was like this last round game is, it, it's almost like a bonus for him. Um, so, Geary went into the clubhouse, sharing the lead with Wei Yi, and had to watch the remaining games between uh, Marsud Lu and Gukesh, and Abdus Satorov and Donchenko. And I'll be showing both those games any moment. Just got to record them.